Um, so just to give a little bit of a background, um, I know you guys all know this, but uh, here's kind of where we're at right now. We, uh, you know, we start off in 1850, pre-industrial revolution, and the world is dominated by biomass. So fast forward, you can see the changing. Right now, we've got oil, gas, coal. That's pretty much the world. We've got, this is hydro and other renewables. So yeah, tiny little slice. It's growing. You have that pointer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah perfect. And so, um, and so you can just kind of see that from here to here is fossil fuels. And so that leads to um, a lot of carbon emissions, which is one of the things that we are going to lower. So then this is, that was a world view. Here's a US view of just the electricity sector. And so you can see that coal is still king. You know, you wonder why the, uh, both campaigns have been in the coal states uh, you know, harping on the issue. That's why. It's uh, still about 46% about of uh, US electricity is generated from coal right now. Um, and so basically, this is the trajectory we're on. And we're you know, continuing up there to a nice clip. So if we want to get down to a place where the emissions need to be lowered to, there's a whole number of things we could do. You know, I mean, we could just turn off all the power plants overnight if we wanted to. We could, we could just stop driving. We could do any number of things that would get us there. You know, but a better approach is to do a number of things. You know, we've got energy efficiency. We've got uh, vehicle, um, vehicle efficiency, renewables. And so, you know, you can be, this is just something I grabbed off the web. But you can you know, have these uh, pie slices, any size and any mix you want to get there. And there's some really interesting reports that, uh, that kind of show how to get there. It's easy. It's yeah, that's just fine for me. Um, so in a traditional utility system, you've got a power plant, transmission lines, and then you know, the, the load in the house, whatever, whatever that is. And you know, you've got this chained kind of efficiency, which adds up to a really low, in the end, efficiency for final usage. Um, and you know, we've got three types of power plants, traditionally. So the base load plant you know, is your coal, nuclear, big hydro, you know, these big massive plants that just go cranking all day, and they put out about the same amount of energy. You get kind of an intermediate plant, like a natural gas plant, and it just kind of follows the load all year. And you get a peaking plant. And so these kind of have different costs associated with them. These are the cheapest to run. These are the most expensive to run. So when you're comparing kind of the costs of solar and the costs of what you're, what you're working with, you've got to look at what you're displacing. So one of the nice things about solar is that because it's generated right here, it's avoiding a lot of this, we're actually getting rid, and it's being generated right at peak time, so the peak time for electricity grid, in middle of July, in the middle of the day, when everyone's air conditioning is on. So, that's, uh, so solar um, has some really interesting effects on the grid. So this is the average efficiency in the US for electricity um, generation? So yeah, so when, for, for distribution lines, that would be pretty average. This would be like a coal plant. Um, okay. When you get into um, a, a nuclear plant, we've got there too. You get into some of the new... Wind will be much higher. Mm -hmm. And when you get into the new um, combined cycle natural gas plants, some of those you can get about 55% efficiency um, out of them. You know? um, but so what I was really kind of looking at here was, you know, when you're talking about you know, solar has about an 18% efficiency right now with a good solar panel, but you know, and you're talking about that about 27 percent efficiency by the time it even gets to your house from a, a uh, from a, um, a traditional plant. You know, you're still you're looking pretty comparable there. Yeah. Now can you say yeah. say a bit mm, more yeah. about the base load and the peaking? Yeah, because those are important issues there. Right? Yeah, and so so this is so it's uh, it's kind of interesting. So basically, you know, you've got these three different kinds of plants, and so the base load plants are just massive. You know, you're talking about plants that are maybe a gigawatt. So um, they're never turned off? Basically. Yeah, they, they, uh, they're only turned off for maintenance. They'll run all year round. Um, the nuclear plants in California um, actually end up when, if the load, so the amount of energy that's getting used, drops below the uh, amount of power that's putting out the plant, they'll pump water uphill into reservoirs with the extra, uh, with the extra power and then just run it through a turbine later on for more power. 
but yeah, they just they try and keep that just flat and steady all year. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the the basic point there is that it's very expensive to turn that on and off. Yeah, I mean, and it's expensive to turn any of these on and off. Yeah, it is. But then, but then you know, a load following plant like a natural gas, like a turbine. I mean, um, like a gas turbine plant, they're basically a jet engine. And so you can ramp them up and down um, really easily, and it doesn't affect their life um, tons. You can do that too with some dams, some hydroelectric dams, um, that you can let the amount of water in and out. Um, and so in the renew renewable area, this is kind of one of the issues with renewables is that traditionally, you know, it's there's very few types of renewables that can generate baseload. Uh, geothermal is one of them. Um, and then load following is really difficult because you've got basically intermittent. You know, if the sun's not out or the wind's not blowing, it's hard to get that. And so that's one of the kind of the takeaways later on is that you know we need a new grid in this country is basically the answer. We need a smarter grid that can have demand response that has storage. Um, but um, and then there's there's also policies that I'll get into later that help. Um, help make the renewables work in this sector. But um, a lot of the kind of old school guys will say that you can't really put renewables in, uh, in these grids that they, they destabilize. And Colorado last year was running their grid on about 50% renewables uh, during the summer. And so it's definitely doable. It, it takes basically a new mindset. It's the smart but, grids? Um, that it's not even really there yet. It was really just their utility operators were running it really well. But they had um, a bunch of solar coming in from the south and they have a ton of wind out east. And so they just had some great resources coming in and they were able to uh, to run their, and so, so that was is the, the management all manual right now or the software which handles? Um, it's uh, it, the, the so basically. Load versus generation. Yeah, and so when you've got these type of, so this basically is on all the time. The load following and the peaking plants, the um, you, depends on the system. Um, generally it's run by utilities, so Rocky Mountain Power they're looking at the load curve and they're actually looking time ahead and they buy power um, when, they, when, it's a, when they need it and they get weather forecasts for how much wind they're going to get and they get all these, and they get weather forecasts also for how much we're going to use and they do all these, this forecasting and it's an amazing amount of forecasting. They've got all these models and then they've got a bunch of guys in a room in front of computers and also calling power plants and just saying, okay, ramp up that gas plant, ramp, okay, turn on this, we're going to need this, okay. And it really is, it's a very dynamic process. So, so it's never, not automated? Um, no, nope, it's, it, it it's kind of automated up to the minute where it happens. Um, and it's all, uh, if you can ever get a field trip sometime, just an excuse to go to like these utility <laughs> command centers, they're really cool. Um, and if you can ever do it in California, California has the kind of worst system ever because they have, uh, is they partially deregulated in the 90s and Enron happened and so they re-regulated and so it's just a mess. But they have what's called an independent system operator, and so it's a nonprofit that runs the entire California grid, and it's uh, it's a fascinating place to go to. That's right near Sacramento. But, so uh, one quick takeaway before mm -hmm. you go on is that the peaking plant is very very expensive. So that yeah. power is extremely expensive. And that's what you're trying to basically displace. So exactly. So it's yeah. an important take home message. Yeah. And so these peaking plants are really cheap to build, but they're really expensive um, to run. You know, you get these. The baseload plants um, you can run for you know a few dollars a megawatt hour. These guys could be fifty dollars a megawatt hour. So they really um, change a lot. And so you know if you look right here, this is the amount basically the utility wants to use it. So the, just that first kind of section they're going to try and fill up as much baseload as possible. So that's the baseload is just like you know what we're using in the middle of the night. So it's the industry that's cranking on. It's you know all of us having you know bunch of lights that just stay on in our homes all the time, refrigerators. Then the intermediate plant would be most days of the year. You know, today, no one's turning on their AC, probably not using any of the peaking plants. It's, but it's expensive to have these, because they're just sitting around doing nothing, and then when you need them, they're really expensive to run. And so, then, yeah, talk about. And so, um, just, uh, you know, this kind of goes into what, in, uh, I was hearing some about the projects you guys are working on, and they're great. This kind of goes into, you know, this, you, you'll have, everyone here will be able to see a different reason that, uh, that this is, a, that solar would work great. Right? This is my friend's place up in uh, Washington. It's um, on this little island, and it's a net zero community, and uh, it's really an amazing place. But uh, they, 
have all this community solar like that uh, that works together, and then the solar thermal on top of their houses. But um, so it so can work in Washington. Yeah, and that's it, and, that, and that's another takeaway. Yeah, um, and then so the everybody you know has a good reason for wanting solar, but then the um, you know there's a million reasons also why solar is hard, um, and a big part of that is that there's an upfront cost to it. You know, you want to put solar panels in your house. Yeah, you have to have a couple of thousand dollars. You know, more than a couple usually. Um, the the economics actually work well for solar because utility rates are always going up. But you know, you, it's a high upfront cost. Um, when you don't have, uh, when you're just an individual, you can't buy. You know, in you can't buy ten megawatts of solar. So you know, no one's really going to give you a group discount usually. Um, you know, people are always saying, "Yeah, I'll do that later." Oh, that's such a good idea. I'll do it later. Um, and then you know you got to go get a contractor, and you know if people don't know the difference between a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour, it gets really complicated when there's a guy walking around the roof telling them all these numbers, and you know they don't really know what's going on. So this slide, I, I love this picture, but I know, never understand why it's night and day at the same time. Um, <laughs> the uh, and so basically the it's a it's a fairly simple industry um, in terms of structure. You've got manufacturers that build the stuff, and then you've got, generally, you can buy solar panels and put them on your house yourself. Very few people do that. Um, you have to be a roofer and an electrician and all that stuff. Um, and it just takes a long time. So generally, people go to solar installers. And they, so the solar installers are out there marketing. They're trying to get you to put on solar. They're, um, they're designing the systems, and then they're installing them. So it's a lot of in-house shops. Some, a lot of them will also offer financing. And so, for commercial sites, they can do uh, they can do all sorts of stuff. These are actually three local examples. This is the Salt Palace downtown. They just had to put a 1.3 megawatt system on their roof. This IKEA in South Jordan just put like a 1.1 megawatt system. And this is the Natural History Museum right up the hill. And um, I think that's right around a megawatt too. And um, and so they generally will either work with probably work with one installer across the country if they're IKEA, they, they work with one installer. Um, or you can, they can put out requests for proposals if you're, the, uh, if you're the Salt Palace, which is actually owned by the county. So the county put out this proposal. And theirs was interesting. They said, we don't want to pay this much, any more than this for electricity. So if you can make this happen, we'll put solar on our roof. And uh, some installers came by and were able to do it. Um, and so they, can, they have some interesting financing um, that they can do. Um, newly, just in the last couple of years, thanks actually to eBay and Utah Clean Energy. Uh, so eBay wanted to move into the state and, um, and open data centers here, and they have a policy that they use 100% renewable energy. But they, uh, but in Utah, that was really going to be difficult for them because of the state policies. So they worked with us and actually got um, the state passed a law that um, allows power purchase agreements. And so power purchase agreements, basically another company installs, owns, and operates the solar system for eBay as if it was an independent power plant. eBay then buys the power from them at a long-term fixed rate. So they can, so eBay can walk in that, uh, that cost and, um, but, and still get the power, but then they don't have to have anybody in-house who's an electrician or specializing in solar, or if, you know, if the panel breaks, it's someone else's deal. So, and then um, another thing that can happen is, so PACE, stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. And um, so basically about a decade ago, um, some UC Berkeley um, political guys got together and were like, we have a great idea. We can, how about we pass a bond and everybody then can apply to get really low interest loans from the city to, uh, to put solar on the roof or do energy efficiency retrofits. And, we, and we'll just fund it from this bond and uh, really low interest, and then it'll, they can pay it back on their property taxes. And so then, it's, then the nice thing about that is then the loan moves with the property, rather than you know, if, you, if somebody puts solar on their house, then they up and they got transferred, well, they, they could be stuck paying off a loan for a system that providing them no benefit. So it was a really neat idea. Unfortunately, some people you may have heard of, uh, Fannie, Fre Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, didn't like it so much. So, they, so it's on hold. Across, uh, and it wasn't just a Berkeley thing, it was actually spread across the country really quick. But uh, that led to it being noticed. And, and what's the con of it? Um, so basically what they don't like 
is that it's what's called a first lien. And so because it's on the taxes, the city would get paid back. If there was a foreclosure, the city would get paid back before Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So they weren't too keen on that. In the commercial space though, this is still an option because those two don't have as big a foothold and there's other, uh, many other entities out there. And so that's actually something that we're working to get a law passed this year to, um, to allow commercial pace. And so allow commercial entities to basically get these, um, get these big projects. Yeah. Could you explain the regulations in Utah that were in place that didn't allow eBay to uh, install or become 100% renewable without going through some complicated process? Well, they could have done it if they wanted to own, operate, and put it on their roof, and, and it was all in-house. So basically, it gets into uh, all of this fun um, legislation about what is and what is not a power plant. And, um, and so there's this law that got passed in the late 70s called PURPA and that, uh, at the federal level, and that basically allowed qualifying facilities to sell their power back um, into the grid at certain ra at, um, at defined rates. And, um, and it actually expanded. It, it's what led to a lot of the renewable energies being able to be used today outside of utilities. But um, so it, it's basically, it's a convoluted thing under PURPA that they weren't, that it looked like it was a power plant that then wasn't part of a utility. And that's not allowed in Utah. And so, um, and so the law had to be kind of amended to say, okay, that's not allowed, but in this instance it is, <laughs> so. So so how does this relate to the feed-in tariffs? Um, uh, so as a, as a home, as a private mm -hmm. person in, pr in principle, like right. in Germany, you can sell the power and, back to the grid, right? And, and you can here too, and, that, and I've got some slides okay. about that later, the, um, and that's called net metering here, okay. and it's really, um, and Utah is actually a fantastic net metering law, only in the last few years, but, uh, but, we, but it's a really nice one. And so, um, just uh, really quick on the residential. So it's similar if you want to get a home improvement, you want to get a deck put on your house. You, uh, you receive bids from different installers. They come out, they'll do a site visit and they'll tromp around your roof, they'll, uh, they'll do some measurements and they'll basically say, okay, um, this, you, your, you know, your utility bills are this much, we can give you a system that's this big, you can fit this many panels, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and so this, this slide um, just kind of show you um, just a little bit about what's going on kind of in all the different sectors. We've got residential utility. Um, and so you can just basically see the, price, the trend line. You know, prices are coming down um, across the board for solar. Uh, so, that's, so each bar, each section is over time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, so it's uh, different. It's actually quarterly in the last couple. And so this is the last couple of years there's been a massive drop, and I've got some slides later that kind of show a little bit of the price over time. And this is only but for solar? This is, yeah, this is just PV solar. What's the uh, blended? What did you say? What was blended? Blended, um, I think, is a, uh, a different, it's not, um, like, it's a different sector. Um, so there's, like, utility and then residential, and I think this is, like, a commercial industrial um, sector. But I'm actually not 100% sure on that one. Um, so today, 2012, Q1, residential prices are what? Um, and so, six dollars. Yep. So about right now, and so uh, in Q1, actually in Utah, the average price of installed solar. So that's after the um, installations so and the wiring and kind of everything's involved in it um, was about uh, 595 a watt in February when the, the last kind of report came out. And um, and so with the community solar, we've lowered that quite a bit. And so this is what's one of the tools um, that you'll see these guys using. Um, it's called a solar pathfinder, and they're really cool. Basically, it's just a dome, and you can see where the shading will be at any given time at that location all year. And, um, and so you can see there's a tree that will be blocking uh, at uh, different times of the day and in different months. And so... So the, they, they place this in one location at one at one instant of time, right? And well, they yeah, and at one instant of time, but you can still you can get a sense of what the okay. what the year round. That's a good optical design. But yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, I was like, I was like, I'm going to an optics class. I have to show a picture of solar. If I had one to bring it, I would have. 
Yeah, uh, if you contact a solar installer, they've all got a million of them. Then grab one to play with. But um, so, and that's the reason that works is because we have a really good idea of what. Each, so one thing I should say, in the solar pathfinder, there's an insert that, uh, and so this is only this uh, kind of pattern only works for. Latitude. Uh, yep, exactly. One specific latitude, and so um, so this one says uh, average sun paths for. Uh, 25 to 31 north latitude, right there. So that would be kind of San Francisco, California, ish. Um, and so the reason that works is we the sun follows defined paths all year, and so you know this is the sunrise and the summer solstice, and then winter solstice. You can see the sun. It's not. It doesn't just feel like there's less light. There really is less light. And then um, and then in the spring and summer, we kind of have that little happy medium there. And so what that lets uh, the installer do is define what the best tilt for your house is. So if, you, you know, if, you're, if your system is going to get the best light in the spring or summer, you want to fix the tilt right at the, at the latitude, because that'll, that'll be the perfect angle for you. Um, you know, if you, for some reason, get your best light in the winter, that would be, um, you'd want to add 15 degrees to make it a steeper angle to get that lower sun, and then the opposite for the summer. And then, so to get state tax credits, this is the legal language um, where they define, basically this is how the state defines the best system in Utah. So, um, so if you want, basically it's south or west and between you know, 30 to 45 degrees. And so. Now, uh, what is the reason to deviate from the, from the prescribed angle? Is that because um, you might have shading or things like that? Yeah, if you have shading, um, and then your roof might be weird angles. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it all, roof, you know, houses are just built, and then we try and build solar on them. That's changing. Um, there's a lot of areas um, that are starting to do what's called solar-ready construction, and that's not only having wiring that goes up to the roof, or plumbing that goes up to the roof, but um, it also has to do with the angle that not only the house is at, but sometimes whole developments. Um, Laramie, Wyoming requires that all the, any new developments have to be oriented so that every house has a great solar resource. And so when they put a roof, if they're going to make a nice broad roof, they have to face it straight south um, for that reason. And so, um, so basically, if you want to know how much the solar system is going to generate, you, you know, add up everything from when the sun kind of comes up in the morning and it's you know high noon at the end of the day, but uh, solar installers aren't really in the habit of doing integrals on rooftops. So um, <laughs> what they do is they conceptualize this thing called peak sun hours, and so they basically somebody's at the National Renewable Energy Lab has gone around the country and integrated this curve for everywhere. And so Salt Lake City has about 5.3 peak sun hours a day. They say, and so that's basically if you condense all of the solar resource into one metric. Uh, averaged um, over one year. Aver yeah, and it's averaged over a year. Yeah, and so um, that includes, you know, the depth of, of winter and the, the peak of summer. Um, and so then when you look around the world, you know, then some crazy person went and did that for the entire world. And uh, you can see the Utah has a pretty fantastic solar resource. Um, and uh, does anybody in the room incidentally know where, which country has the most solar installed? Germany. Yep. And so, uh, you got that too quick. Um, so so you, were, you were asking about Seattle with its, all its uh, mm -hmm. fog. So look at the solar resource in Germany and the solar resource in Washington. It's, you know, it's nothing like Utah. And the reason that Germany has such amazing amounts of solar is policies. Um, and so uh, just, this is you know, another talking point you like to hear during the elections that uh, that solar and other renewables only work because of these crazy subsidies. And, uh, and we're definitely working, and that's one of the projects we're working on, is to get uh, solar to a point where it's not subsidized at all. But basically, the takeaway here is all energy is subsidized in the US. There's not any type of thought. This is why, you, uh, why there's a lot of talk in Iowa about corn and uh, ethanol. And, uh, so, the, the, hmm. like, yeah. so these are billions of dollars in 
average annual subsidy mm -hmm. o over, over that period. Yeah, over, so this is over you know nine years, um, and then you know th this is only over fifteen years that these have been in play. But yeah, but this has been the average annual. It's not the uh, not the total. Yeah, that's interesting. So, yeah, so just a. Uh, is one of those kind of back to reality, but uh, but good policies are essential. So, I'm going to talk about a few of them um, that that really make a solar market. You know, you were asking why eBay wasn't able to do that, um, and you know, it's it, a lot of it just goes back to these you know hundred year old policies where you you know when they established the utilities about hundred years ago, they they said this is the way this is done, and so now it takes some unweaving to do it, even though it seems like the, they just want to build it. Solar panel on the roof, um, and so we've got net metering, which is which we'll talk about a lot. That's uh, that's basically that's the one that when it, it has only been in Utah since 2002, and that's basically what made the economics work for solar, um, both at a commercial and a uh, and a residential scale. Um, there's state, uh, state federal um, and state and federal tax incentives, and so right now the uh, the state has. Um, gives you 25% uh, of the system cost off of your taxes, um, up to $2,000, and then the federal government will give you 30% off your taxes, uh, of the system cost off your taxes. So they can, you know, so that adds up to, you know, a few thousand dollars from each of them. Um, it's not a credit, so it's a, uh, it's an incentive. So if you don't pay uh, any income tax or you don't have enough tax, then it doesn't work. So it's not, it's not the same as basically them taking that price off of the system. But you have four years to use those. So if you, you, know, if you, don't, make, if you don't pay that much tax every year, yeah, you, can, you can lower that over a four year time frame. The federal one's gonna expire in 2016. The state one's probably not gonna expire. Um, and just with the climate in Washington, I can't imagine the federal one will be react unless things change drastically. Um, and then sales tax is kind of interesting because in Utah there's no sales tax on um, solar systems. Um, there is an increase in your property tax from having a house that's worth more, but um, appraisers in Utah are a little bit behind the times. And I guarantee you put solar on your house, they will not notice for about 10, 15 years. Um, that's happening. Um, and then so renewable portfolio standards are another big one. Um, so you probably heard California ha utilities have to, uh, by this year, generate uh, or they have to sell 20% uh, of their electricity sold has to be from renewable sources. Um, by 2020, it has to be 30%, and they're actually on track to make it this year, which is amazing, because uh, as much as two years ago they weren't. Um, Utah has a voluntary one, which you can imagine how well that works. Um, but, uh, and, but there's different renewable portfolio standards all over the country. And those real, work really well for getting um, for getting more renewables into the grid. Um, and there's talk at, at a federal level about making a federal renewable uh, standard that a certain amount would have to be from from renewables. Um, so then, another um, interesting one is that utilities around the country now have basically laws that say if there are renewables on available, you have to buy them. So when we were talking earlier about those, about the different kinds of plants, so the, basically the utilities form these contracts with these plants to buy, we'll buy this energy here, this energy there. Well, that doesn't really work for like a wind farm because they don't know exactly when they're gonna be generated. So the utilities actually have to buy the renewable energy when it's available. And so whenever you see a windmill turning, it's actually being bought on the grid um, and it's being used. Um, which is an interesting one, and then um, so the, the, I remember reading a few years ago in Europe there was the problem of uh, utilities complaining about wind because the price went down too much. Mm. There was too much wind power coming on. Is this related? Yeah. To that? Well, and um, and that would be yeah because they they have to buy it, and uh, what they buy it at is their avoided cost. So um, it, basically, there's always quibbling about what the avoided cost should be. Like, what's the if they're buying wind, what would they be buying at that time? You know, they, they'll argue that, oh, we were just gonna buy some really cheap coal at that time, so we bought wind instead, we shouldn't pay you very much for that, for that wind. But, uh, you know, they might, but it's, you know, it's actually, no, that was in, right in the peak, you know, you'd be running a peaking plant, it's really expensive. And so, there's always quibbling about what was the avoided cost and how much, you know, these guys should get paid. It's also, I recall reading something about New Jersey, 
that is uh, like the, the biggest solar installation in the US? They is do. That, is, yeah, and, that, and that's true. And that's because they've had a really um, generous uh, tax incentives up uh, until now. And they've, uh, it's, been, um, it's been one of those things that's like a no-brainer to put solar on your house in New Jersey. And they have been, that's been kind of getting taken down in the last few years pretty heavily. And so the solar industry there is just up in arms. And so that's why it's making national news because they got used to these really generous subsidies. And now that they're going away, they're really not too happy about it. And, um, and so the, but consequently, New Jersey, which another, you know, if we went back to that map, you know, New Jersey doesn't have Utah's solar resource, but has a ton of solar installed. And so policies can make all the difference here. Um, and then so we, uh, one of the things that we did just uh, get in, it's, uh, this is about two weeks old, um, the, uh, the State Public Utility Commission approved um, Rocky Mountain Power to give, a, uh, to give an incentive for solar. And so it's about a dollar a watt that they're going to be taking off. And so they're going to be doing, over the next five years, 60 megawatts of solar. And, and so right now we have 10 megawatts of solar installed in Utah. And so we're going to go about a factor of 600 or 6 up from that, 600% uh, up from that over the next couple of years just with these incentives that Rocky Mountain Power is giving. So are these solar farms or residential um, solar? Both actually. Um, it's commercial, industrial, and then, um, and then residential. It's, uh, the residential is really, uh, really small comparatively. Are there any big kilo. solar farms in Utah? There's not really yet, um, but, uh, but that's one of the things that this, um, that this could change. Um, there are uh, the the residential incentive. It's only 500 kilowatts a year, um, and so that's not terribly huge. But then um, the rest of that is going to basically the other, you know, 58 um, megawatts is going to be, you know, commercial like kind of like the Salt Palace or you know if there's a if there's a solar farm out there, and so that's going to be a real game changer because the uh, a lot of companies that were looking at it and it just didn't quite make sense for them. If it's another dollar per watt off, you know, and then they're putting in a 1.1 megawatt plant, that's, you know, they just saved a million dollars. So it's really, that, that's going to be huge. Um, and then the other thing that can strengthen the solar market is um, what Rajesh was talking about a little while ago, which is the streamlined permitting, zoning, and financing. And, um, and so as part of that, the Wasatch Solar Challenge is part of a Department of Energy program. And so we're working to do exactly this, and I'll talk about that. And then they're proposing a, the DOE has a new proposal out that we haven't quite finished uh, parsing yet, but is uh, for aiming for basically the non-technical um, parts of solar to be less than a dollar uh, a watt right now. Um, and they want somebody to basically install um, 6,000 systems and then come back to them and say they did it at, that, at an average of that price and then DOE will give you $7 million. And we're like, well, that's kind of a gamble. <laughs> you don't have to that. What's a soft cost? Um, so uh, that's, uh, so I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, soft costs are um, like customer acquisition. And so, you know, if, you, if you're going out there and you're trying to educate all, you have to educate the entire Salt Lake Valley to get, you know, 10 people who are excited about solar or something like that. So then, you know, you're going to have to wrap just because you know your business has to wrap that cost into its system to recoup. You know, so you've got all of these costs that have nothing to do with that, um, that have nothing to do with kind of the installation itself, but you know, and then the permitting fees. You know, the building department. You know, it doesn't really add anything technically to the system. Um, well. Like, that's a debate. But, um, it's like but marketing the, and permitting. Marketing, permitting, all that kind of stuff um, that then gets wrapped into and makes the system more expensive. And so, um, so net metering is the feed-in tariffs we were talking about earlier. So this is um, Desire's a, uh, a Department of Energy website. And it's a database of state renewable, the state incentives for renewable and efficiency. And so if you ever want to know what's going on in different states, that's a, it's a fantastic resource. Um, and so Utah has a really good net metering system. So net metering is basically where you can, it's what makes the economics work for solar. So before 2002, when the state legislature passed a net metering law, you could put solar on your house, but you know, it would be a great thing for the environment, but it wasn't, you couldn't make any money. It didn't matter if you were feeding that into the grid, you know, your meter doesn't run backwards, you know? And so you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't have a very high power bill, but 
it would it basically cause a lot of problems with that. So net metering is where you've heard of people's meters running backwards or people getting paid for the power they're producing. That's what net metering is. And so it's basically, it's a, um, a financing tool. And so the, so Rocky Mountain Power, basically if you hook up a solar system, every, they'll, they'll install a new meter on your house and it'll keep track of what's coming off your meter and also what's going in from the grid. And they'll balance it out. And so every kilowatt hour you use, um, or every kilowatt hour you produce, they'll subtract one from the one you're using. And, uh, and so then if you generate more than you use, the end of the month that rolls over and you can use that the next month. And so that's really nice because you'll generally in the summer you'll produce a lot more than you will in the winter. And so you try and balance it out. So when you're sizing a system, you want to balance it out um, for an entire year because you know, every March they basically zero you out and you, uh, and you have to start over. Um, that's, so some places like California, I have some friends in California who have solar, and they actually purposefully oversized their systems because they get a check in the mail if they generate, and so again, it avoided cost. And so they actually can generate their own power and get a little bit of uh, a return on that. You can't do that in Utah, so you, but you can get down to basically a zero power bill. And the avoided costs are the fixed costs, are these long-term Mm -hmm. Agreed costs or they, yeah. they fluctuate? Um, and so the, the avoided costs get, they get, so there's a rate case um, just about every year where the Public Utilities Commission and, um, and Rocky Mountain Power is the regulated utility. Basically, they, and, and then stakeholders like us, we all come together and we say, okay, you know, we think the, you know, the avoided cost should be here, we think it should be here. And so, you know, and everybody's just trying to get their best deal and everybody gets their models and they get their, you know, lawyers and come together and then you know you figure out basically and then they settle on that and you know sometimes it'll be for one year two years whatever that rate case is good for but then that the, it'll be a fixed amount that's in the uh, in the in the regulatory law for that that um, it's nice and nice and complicated can, can, can you tell us mm -hmm. what those numbers are the, the yeah and so um, 25 slash 2000. so the 25 slash 2000 is that there's a uh, basically systems over for residential systems, um, you to you can't have a system over 25 kilowatts um, and get net metering as a residential, um, and you can't do over um, basically two uh, megawatts as a commercial system and, and net meter. You can net, net meter up to that point, regardless um, of the size of the property or the yeah. Your actual, I mean, if you had a mm -hmm. giant mansion with three pools. Right. You still would only be allowed to do 25 yep. kilowatts. And so yeah, it's yeah. 25 kilowatts is the cap for that. Um, and then, so California has no um, no cap for residential, but they do have one for, uh, for commercial. Um, and so, you know, you get all these kind of different systems coming together, but, uh, the, but a 25 kilowatt system would be absolutely massive. Um, yeah, that would be a huge system. So, you know, it, do, it doesn't come, it, that would really come in kind of in a small business. Are there any policies anywhere that play nice with uh, mixed-use communities, so like residential, commercial, uh, all in one kind of area that would use renewable resources? It would well, and it, it's it, it's really interesting. Um, but what a mixed-use community would probably want to do would be a power purchase agreement, um, like we talked about earlier. They an entity could be set up, and they could set up. Um, one thing that happens is they'll set up a kind of like a you know like the Mill Creek. Um, you know, solar association, and they'll just set this thing up, and then they can, as an association, buy the solar system and then all buy power from it. Um, and then that association could then get the tax incentives and everything. So that that's one one way to do it. Um, it is it can get tricky when you get you know these mixed use, you know, because what is commercial, what's uh, what's not. Um, there's usually that's kind of why they do the 25 there because it's. Um, you know, there's debate. You know, some solar installers will say, "Well, it's 15, you know, kilowatts as a of and above as a commercial system," and you know, and some will say it's 25. So, but there's not really any. You know, the systems all work kind of the same way. Once it, what I've heard is, once you get up to the kind of the 50 kilowatt level, that's when they really, you know, start acting differently, and you know, you have to have you know different kinds of inverters and everything. But at 25 kilowatts, you can it can act kind of like a uh, like a residential system. So like New York, there's one, two, three, four, five different numbers. Is that just? 
I yeah, that's probably I bet I bet there's some yeah, I bet it's something about different that. Different sizes. Of yeah, I bet there's different, you know, and then you've got, you know, maybe, you know, this is like a skyscraper and you know, this is like okay. different You can probably click on all these on the website itself. So. Yep. Yeah, and so yeah, if you get yeah, if you go to uh, D S I R E um, dot dot org, um, then you can you can look at any state and it's and it's written out and there's actually state contacts. It's like who who do you talk to at the state level if you want to know more. Um, so it's it's a really interesting um, system, and and it's not just for um, net metering. They've got you know if you want to know your tax incentives, if you want to know anything kind of like that. Why are some of the like South Dakota vice like nothing? Um, they don't actually have net metering. So South Dakota is kind of what Utah was going was like in um, in two thousand two. Right. So you can't you basically can't get credit for anything you generate there, um, and so now it's forty three states. Um, that uh, that allow net metering, but you know it's definitely an uphill slog um, to get you know some of these states like you know Idaho or Texas to uh, to jump on board. And so um, so this is just kind of a um, a rundown of what we were just talking about. You know where you get a kilowatt hour for kilowatt hour credit, and then um, so a residential system would be max of twenty five kilowatts, and a commercial system is uh, two megawatts. So in, in, in Utah, let me make sure I understand right, your mm -hmm. credits basically get reset every spring, is, is what mm -hmm. you're saying. And yeah, and so... Whereas yeah. in other states, you could get, you could make money from your system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it really depends on, on the state. Every state's pretty much done it differently. What, um, the interesting thing is that, um, so this right here is ABCDF. It's a, uh, basically a national scorecard as to who's getting what. And Utah had an F for their net metering a couple of years ago. Um, and that's because it was needlessly restrictive. And so then um, another thing that we got passed was a new, uh, basically a, uh, an amendments bill to that original net metering. And since then, this is from 2009, but since then we've been getting A's. We actually have one of the best net metering um, programs in the country. And so, and the report's called Free and Great, if you ever wanna check it out. We'll talk about the different states around the country. Um, and then, so um, basically, the Department of Energy has been really big in trying to lower soft costs and to get these these uh, policies online. And um, and so the they started a few years ago with the Solar America Cities and Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, um, Utah Clean Energy, all kind of got together to basically try to do adopt solar friendly policies. Um, and that's where um, Salt Lake City re redid their entire zoning ordinance. Um, to uh, to allow for more solar, um, and so so that was kind of the beginning, um, and so here just to kind of give you a sense, here's 2001. So this is before net metering, and then you know now we're at 10,000 or 10, 10 megawatts, you know, really an increase. And then you can see the trend line here. This is uh, kind of the last couple of years in the country installations per year. Um, I'm not really sure what happened. The end of 2004 or, or 2010, but um, but you know, there's a national, yeah. Well, and the the stimulus money was oh, huge yeah. in getting um, a lot of a lot of this online. Um, and then so just just in kind of another um, little timeline showing you what you know that the the policies are what drives. You know the technology is getting better and better and better, but the policies are a lot of what's been driving. The market, you know, it's, it, you can see, especially in the commercial sector, it's really ramped up like crazy. Um, and so then, what we're talking about a little while ago, so the rooftop solar challenge is um, Department of Energy. So basically, there's almost 18,000 jurisdictions around the country that have something to say about a solar panel. So if you wanted to be a national solar installer, you could potentially need to know the administrative code of 18,000 jurisdictions. So basically, that's <laughs> Um, so the Department of Energy put together this uh, project, and so there's 22 teams around the country that are working to basically streamline permitting to get it down to kind of like a single easy form that you can walk into your building department and just give them this, and, and then they just go, oh, that looks good, I know that solar, I know that brand, I know that installer, stamp, there you go, um, out the door. And then, um, and also to basically make zoning. One, uh, you guys are in optics class. Uh, one of the really interesting things is that uh, the zoning officials are always worried about reflectivity. They, uh, even though solar is designed to absorb light, they don't seem to understand that windows are designed to reflect it. But 
they, uh, they it's, that's one that's kind of a constant battle. So um, you know, so the zoning people really get in. They're the ones who say, okay, you can build a solar panel, but it can't be visible from the street, or it can't be this high above your house, or it, uh, you know, they can't. All these kind of things. You know, if you're in a historical neighborhood, there's all sorts of restrictions. Um, and so we've been working with them to put together uh, a model solar ordinance that will <coughs> basically, you know, get rid of a lot of those things. Say, you know, okay, the solar is allowed under these circumstances, and so we're putting one together for Utah that will hopefully alleviate a lot of those problems. Oregon has something where if you put a solar panel in mm -hmm. and somebody's tree grows up in front of it, they have to cut that tree down. If you put the panel there before the trees. Okay. And so, yeah, and so that's, uh, and so that gets to a really interesting thing, which is the solar easements. And so, um, so you can, there's different ways that that, that, that works. So there's, um, you can either go into an easement with your neighbors. So you can basically say, I have a solar system. You will, and so you'll recognize my right to have that and you won't do anything that'll block it. But then an easement moves with a property. So they've actually just effectively lowered their property value because a future owner of that property couldn't build a new story or let a tree grow or the other things. So, so it's really interesting. But one of the things that people enter into easements with is the city because there's you know, the trees in front of your house and those are city owned trees so that you can say like, hey, don't, hey city, you can't let the tree grow up there. <laughs> um, and, but there's definitely, um, and then there's solar access laws. Um, in England, if you uh, if solar or if there's been if light has shown on something for 20 years, it's basically it's your light. And um, so <laughs> if, like, if if you've got a building that was there and then somebody builds a skyscraper, they have to compensate you for your light that you've lost. Um, and so uh, and so we that that's actually been tested in the U.S. and Supreme Court. But um, but they but there's definitely around the country there's different. Um, there's different things like that that basically ensure your access because you don't, you know, the economics of your system don't work out. You've made this big investment, and then if your neighbor has a tree grow, that you know you've kind of just spent a couple thousand dollars for not too much gain. So there's a, there's a lot of policies that are in place to basically alleviate problems with that. And so this is something that we're uh, that we've been working on a bunch, and um, and it's really cool. Um, the you can see that it's really a nationwide effort. Um, some places you know that you know there's a Tennessee group and a Texas group and a Puerto Rico group, um, and then you know of course there's a San Francisco group or five of them. Um, and then uh, I'm, by the way, I'm what from the Bay Area. What is this about? Sorry. Oh, so these these are the different uh, teams that are working on that rooftop solar challenge. Oh, I see. And so um, and so there's all sorts of uh, different ones. And so it was originally designed as a challenge. So they're grading us. So our our team is Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, Midvale, um, Midvale uh, West Valley City, Park City, and Summit County. Um, and we're so we're working with all of them to do this. And so there's a whole complicated point thing that we're all trying to get more points. But halfway through, they realized that actually we should just be taking the good ideas that everybody does and just having everybody implement those rather than having because there's 18,000. The problem is there's 18,000 rules. So adding 22 more didn't seem like such a great idea. So, um, but so they, uh, but so now it's become a really big collaboration, uh, and so different areas have been having some great ideas, and so everybody's kind of feeding everyone else with it. So, what's the challenge again? The my, the my um, and so it's uh, basically to try to get um, it's kind of this right here. So the administrative barriers to um, to. PV. Basically, like, so if you go to the different building departments, every, in Salt Lake Valley, every little jurisdiction, so you've got, you know, Midvale, you've got um, Sandy, you've got West Jordan, South Jordan, everybody's going to have a different form that you need to fill out. So if you're a solar installer, it's really complicated. Everybody's going to have a different fee, so you can't tell someone what the permitting fee is going to be. Um, everyone's going to have different zoning laws, so, and so it's just, it's really, it gets really complicated. So what we're trying to do is get, at, at first, these six jurisdictions that are on board with us to um, kind of adopt a standard model so that at least they, they all are going to know um, what's going on. And then after that, um, hopefully others, um, West Jordan has been contacting us because they're actually redoing their ordinances. And they're like, well, we might as well learn from you guys while we're doing this. And so, um, and so West Jordan is putting a lot of this, uh, these kind of things in. So what are the more, most, most creative ideas that are coming out from 
What, what have um, you seen from around the country? So one of the one of the best just things for this is that um, the DOE sponsored a group to create uh, a single permitting form that basically everybody in the country can use, and we had to actually modify it because it didn't include snow. Um, so, look, but um, but so so we modified that, and it's just that's just a really nice, easy thing that everyone can do. Um, but there's been there's been some really great ideas. There's this one group that we're creating a website too. But they're creating basically a toolkit for a web toolkit for jurisdictions that want to go through this process that uses all the lessons learned from everyone around the country and they're uh, putting this all together in a group called Optini. And they're they're going to then be able to give this to other jurisdictions and like that can walk them through basically an online guide to how they can adopt better um, better practices um, and so so yeah so it's been it, it's really interesting and so this wraps up in uh, in uh, February and as part of this uh, process we uh, we got funding for the for something called that we called solid community solar and so that's uh, that's one of the things I'm here to tell you about today because it was a really cool program it's just kind of finishing up now but so what we did is we took a model that was used really successfully in Portland. And so they, um, it was just a woman in Portland wanted to go solar. And this is back in like 2007. And she looked into it and she's like, this is way too expensive. But then she had the idea that like, you know, if a kind of a Costco model or a Groupon model, that if a lot of us buy it, it'll probably be cheaper. And so she just got her whole neighborhood together. And then they went to a solar installer and they said, okay, all of us want to do it. How cheap can you make it? And so they put out requests for proposals to different installers, and they actually were shocked at how much cheaper it was. And um, and it was such a it was such a success that they had all these other solar installers getting mad, saying, "But you're eating up all our business." And so then they had to lower their prices to uh, to be able to compete. And so the price actually dropped for everybody in Portland. And so that's exactly what we're seeing here too. Is that um, so? Back basically about a year ago. Um, some community members wanted to do this, and so we helped them uh, get set up with a steering committee. We helped them put together requests for proposals. They did that. Um, nine solar installers ended up bidding on this project, and uh, they chose um, they chose one. And basically, what's been happening is we've been then doing outreach to the community to try and get people to uh, to sign up and get solar assessments from the installer, and then um, they so they sign up. They take a survey with their kind of their usage, their uh, roof space, all that kind of stuff. They, that comes to me, and then I give that to the, to the installer. They then contact them, give them a price. Um, they, they've got a Google Earth, basically do a little mock-up of what the, the system might be. Then they go out, if the people aren't scared away by the price, they, they go out, do a site assessment, and then they, they go back and design their system in AutoCAD, and then you know, give them a, a final bid that's going to include you know, all the wiring, all the racking, every, everything like that. And so um, basically, so if you remember, we were talking about how the average price in Utah in February was uh, 595 a watt. So the price now is 350 a watt through Solid Community Solar. So the price came down quite a bit. So that just kind of goes to show the power of these of uh, the community purchase model. So how many uh, people and where involved? So right how many now, installations? So right now, um, so it's still ongoing. So we had to turn off the survey because we were just getting, we actually weren't sure. Um, when we talked to the installer, they were thinking that they probably have about maybe 70, 50 to 70 kilowatts installed. Um, right now, we're at- uh, How we're, many systems would that be? Um, they're about three kilowatts a piece. Mm -hmm. be three, three is about a standard residential system, between two and four. Okay. Um, it's been pretty standard. Um, to, to kind of displace the entire usage of an average house in Utah, you'd want to get maybe like a six. And so people are getting rid of about two thirds of their, um, about, of their generation. And um, so we had 270 people um, sign up for solar surveys. Um, right now, this number's old because as of yesterday, it was 150 kilowatts are installed. So it's actually far exceeding what anybody thought. Even so, so you know, is it geographically in a, in a particular location? Can it be spread out? How is um, so we're doing just Salt Lake County with this one. Oh, um, you came anywhere in the county? Anywhere in the county, yeah. And um, oh, I should have thrown in, I've got a nice little uh, Google Earth um, um, 
map of where everybody was, but it's primarily sent, uh, most of them were in Salt Lake City proper. But yeah, we had them all over the county, um, everywhere, and uh, and it's really cool because, you know, people you know definitely don't think of solar when they think of uh, Utah, and the especially on a national scale. And so this is getting a lot of attention because people are starting to say, hey, you had almost 300 people, and you know we would have we actually had over 300 people take the survey, but 270 is the number that were in Salt Lake County. We had somebody as far away as Panguitch actually take our survey, um, which is down near Cedar City. Um, and so uh, it's really been a huge success. Um, and the, um, there's been, I think, 40 or so um, households that are getting solar. And that's just now that people still have a couple more weeks to, uh, to basically put down their deposit for their system. So the, how is your guys' program different than the Portland one? Because I noticed you guys, uh, renters aren't eligible. I think renters are eligible in Portland. They had uh, different, it, they actually have run it uh, a bunch of times. Um, they've done it like five times there. And they've done it sometimes where they have two solar installers uh, who are part of it. Sometimes where they did what we did, which is where we um, basically got um, a, a solar installer to, uh, to give us, they gave us different tiers. Um, and at different amounts of solar installed, everybody would get a different price. Um, they did it sometimes where they got a big group together and then went and then said, okay, we have 100 people, we want to do this now. So they did it a lot of different ways. So um, th but this is a proposal, right? But once at the end of the day, when you finalize mm -hmm. what is actually going to be done, these numbers will get fixed somewhere. And, and they actually have been, yeah, because um, a lot of people have now already um, installed and paid for their system. So the, the uh, the contractor demanded 75% upfront, basically, um, for the system, and then the other 25% they held off on until um, until they had final price set. And so we've passed basically the final tier, so everybody knows the final price. And so that was definitely, you know, people were worried that that would that there'd be some discrepancy between the bid and the final price. But they they've been very honest, and they've been we've been That's getting good. really great feedback. Yeah. And so, uh, and so you can then see too what the final price is for um, for a kilowatt without um, if you if you can get take advantage of tax incentives, it makes it very, very basically a no brainer. Um, at that point, I've got a little uh, model that uh, looks at the the. Um, what is the roughly uh, payback time in terms of? Plus, uh, savings from energy. It, it really it depends on where you're at um, and all the different incentives that you can get. No, I mean, um, but it, so yeah. for for like a system, you know, this would probably be 15 to 20 years. Um, with these systems, we're generally seeing about 11 to 14 years. Um, and then you know, if you're down here, you're maybe in like the five to 10 year range. Um, and the lifetime of the solar system is 25 years. So um, it's really that's and that's where I was saying earlier that the economics works out is that you know if you're if you're living in your home and you're going to be there for a while that oh you basically the best way I've ever heard it described is if you could go back to 1990 and buy gas how much gas would you buy at 1990 prices because that's basically what's going on is you're locking in a rate and that much of your energy whatever you can do is just paid for because the one because Rocky Mountain Power has I hate to break to you guys told us that, rate, that rates are going to go up every year for the next 10 years. And so, um, so when you look at it that way, the, the solar, um, if you can lock in a rate today, then you just you just kind of just got that set no matter what else happens. Now, who sets that rate, by the way? I kind of missed that part. Who so, sets the rate if you have your own solar? Um, so basically, you'll still be on, um, just unless you live in Murray, they're the only ones around here that are on a different system. Um, but so Murray is their own utility, but everybody else um, in the Salt Lake area is on Rocky Mountain Power, and so they're an investor-owned utility. So is there a set different rate for solar versus regular? And no, and products. so they, um, so it's the, and so they're just um, basically what happens is you, unless you go off grid and you get a battery backup system and everything for your solar, which you can do, um, you are still hooked up to them, and so they'll just charge you basically a rate for whatever energy you use, after the, basically the net energy after your, after your production has been taken out. Okay. And so you, you pay the same rate that everybody else pays. Um, they have um, Rocky Mountain Power, most people don't deal with it, um, but they have a minimum bill, and so in, which is about $7 a month. 
And so even if you got your usage down to zero, you'd still pay Rocky Mountain Power $7 a month. Um, and so, but that, that's about um, 30 kilowatt hours or 50 kilowatt hours, something, so, uh, such a low number that most people always use more than the minimum bill anyway. Uh, do you have concerns, or do people here in, in Salt Lake Valley have concerns with the uh, the roof not lasting as long as the solar system itself. And that's definitely something we had um, people take the survey um, and and start talking to the installer and they're like, well, I want to get a new roof in five years, what's that gonna mean? And it usually means a couple thousand dollars because you can, you basically have to take everything off. You can you get to keep all the equipment, of course, but then the taking it off and putting it back on is a couple thousand dollars in labor usually. So we had a lot of people who ended up um, holding off and saying, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna get a couple more years out of my roof and then put it on. But the nice thing is the solar system, the average life is about 25 years, or the warranty life, and then roofs, like uh, residential roofs tend to last about 25 years. So um, we did, but we did have a few people who specifically um, got a new roof put on um, right this fall and they're, and they're getting solar so that they will have kind of that benefit going out. It's an interesting question, actually, because it's an engineering challenge. I mean, can you mm -hmm. take it out and put it up? In fact, I think there was a DOE program looking at this specific problem. Mm -hmm. So we brought up in so how do you solve that problem from an engineering perspective? Can you make it plug and play somehow? And that was definitely something that uh, I was going to bring up later, because you know you guys were looking at you know new markets, and that's definitely a big one. And I'll, um, I think that actually maybe like one. Yeah, it's like one of my next slides. But um, is that you know that that's that's one of the areas that the technology is really far behind. Um, is like how do you every system basically needs to be designed in AutoCAD right now, which you know if you go back to soft cost, that's a huge soft cost. Like doesn't have anything to do with the panels themselves, but they you know you have to, if you have to sit and that's one of the big bottlenecks in our systems that we have. These guys are trying to mock up 270 systems in AutoCAD, and it takes forever. And so. Um, and so basically, you know, if we want to talk about uh, kind of the solar market in Utah, that um, we have a fantastic solar resource. Um, the net metering laws are getting really good. Um, they're rocking on power is getting an incentive. So we're really doing good. We don't have that renewable portfolio standard, but um, but really the the kind of the economics, the the framework is set in Utah. That's not and that can't be set for everywhere. Um, but I do have a friend uh, who is. Uh, works on this in Thailand, and he actually snuck through a fantastic net metering law in Thailand. So if you ever go there, you can get paid a lot for your, uh, for your displaced power. Um, and so, um, and so then there, but there's a lot of stuff that's gonna be coming in the next couple of years where we work on commercial pace and, um, and P, kind of PPAs for um, people. One of the things, one, another model you can do in other states, um, like California, you might have heard of, there's a group called Sunrun, there's Sungevity, there's all these kind of big installers, and what they'll do is they'll basically kind of do what the PPA did with eBay, is you go and they'll install a system on your roof and then you buy the power from them, and the, and it's usually set up in the form of a lease, so that you can, after the lease period, you can have the option to buy it and all these kind of things. So you so don't that, have any ca upfront capital And so yeah, costs. you wouldn't have any upfront capital, they'd come and, uh, and put it on your house and you'd work out a, um, you'd work out basically how much you want to pay for power, and so you're going to work that out to be lower than your utility rates, and you work out how much uh, how much you could uh, buy it for at the end of the period, you know, and generally the longer that you lease it from them, the better your rates. What so, if you don't buy it at the end? What happens? Uh, different, different things. That you could continue leasing it from them and buying power, um, or they can come take it back. <laughs> so, um, so it's, I don't know that I would go that route, but I know some people who have and have been very, uh, a woman called me the other day and was asking, um, she has a second home in Park City and she, she lives in Silicon Valley and they, that's what they do on her home. She's just like, it's so easy. I want to do that on my place in Park City. But uh, like, no, not yet. But so a lot, uh, so there's I, a lot coming. The, the reason it's not in Utah is because of state, state regulations? Law. Yeah, and so, um, but there are some, there are some basically uh, of those big national groups who think that they have, the, 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 the buzz is that they think they found some ways in. Um, but kind of the explicitly, it's you know it, it may it may turn out to be a gray area, but right now it's just kind of not allowed. And so the kind of the future. So here's if you're looking at a four kilowatt system, 
and here's the US, and here's Germany. And this is just a, uh, a national thing. So some of these things, you know, we don't have sales tax in Utah. So there's not, that's not kind of comparable apples to apples, but quite exactly. But, you know, it's, it's pretty good. So you can see that this is the answer to why Germany has more solar than anybody else. And so where the, you know, if you look, the profit's about the same. The, you know, the cost of the panels, the cost of the inverter, the electrical hardware, it's all about the same because those are, you know, those are commodities. Um, where the real difference are is that they have really efficient supply chains, their customer acquisition costs are almost zero because they're, the education is there. Um, and it's really basically, uh, they're super efficient op uh, operations and they don't have uh, some of the red tape that, um, that the US has that can kind of get this caught up. So, and that's, you know, the challenge then, if you guys are interested in this stuff, is to, you know, how do you, you know, while we continue to work on customer acquisition costs, permitting, all these kind of things, how do you continue to lower the prices in a world where the prices really are stabilizing? The, uh, you know, you can only get to a certain price for silicon. Um, and when we're, and we're starting to hit that, um, the price in the last few years has been incredibly low actually for solar because the glut of uh, Chinese panels that has been coming in. So the, the market price uh, just dropped. And so that's actually, you know, there's some new tariffs that are coming out probably on, on those. So the, those prices are in, a lot of those firms are going under anyway. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, kind of, the, the, the industry is becoming more mature and the prices are stabilizing. But, you know, as you guys all know in here, the technology definitely, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity for it to get better. Um, the projections right now are, you know, you know, in 10 years we'll see, you know, 21 to 23 percent efficiency. But, you know, I think they're projecting from a base where they're looking at current technology. They're, they're not even looking at, you know, potential, uh, the, the potentials for new technologies. So, um, and then, so, uh, these are, this is, the number one is a fun graphic, but have you guys heard about the space-based solar? Uh, how it works, yeah. So it's not actually just in science fiction. Uh, PG&E in California, the big utility, um, put out a request for proposals a couple of years ago. And basically this is what a lot of people think is, uh, is a future model, is that you get basically a, you know, a transistor radio, old transistor radios didn't have batteries. They ran off the radio waves that were coming in. And so this would be the same thing as you beam microwaves. You basically get in space where you know, there's no zoning laws and, you, uh, and then you beam the power down. And so this is definitely something that's being looked at. But um, you know, when, when we're talking about what the future is, you know, increasing efficiencies, um, the smart grid is gonna be huge. You know, there's all different companies. Google, what they think is that they're, they're trying to make uh, software that basically can um, dispatch power from electric cars. So they use all the cars that, you know, statistically most cars are parked at any one given time. So if they're all plugged in and they're electric cars, that actually acts as one massive battery. And so, um, so there's a lot of different really cool stuff going on in that realm. Um, and then, um, and basically, um, you know, in the end it's making solar a no-brainer. And so for that, the, um, wanted to basically, I mentioned exactly what you're talking about, the plug and play system, is that uh, Germany is starting to see this, it's just kind of coming out, that if you basically, if you want to get a solar on your house in Germany, you can actually go to an installer, and if you were really, really gung-ho, you could probably have it installed by the next afternoon. In the US, that would be crazy to have it installed before a week from now just because there's all, every, everything to go to. But one of the things that they're really looking at is how do you make it so you don't have to design each system independently? Like how can a guy, you get it, so it's a guy showing up in a truck, you know, and he's got all these panels and you just put them on your house. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so that's kind of the, where that's at. Oh, and then, uh, I almost forgot to show you these things. So um, these are just some fun things for you guys to play with. Um, Salt Lake City has this amazing solar map and so, uh, just in case the internet didn't work, I, I kind of went and mocked it up. So this is uh, our building right now. And so, this is a patented, uh, Salt Lake City actually has a patent on this. Um, and uh, a guy named Kevin Bell designed it. And basically what he did is he took LiDAR data, so it's like laser uh, telemetry data. They flew a plane over Salt Lake City. 
And for every meter of the city, he simulated the sun moving through that meter at every point, at every day of the year, and taking into account shadows. So you can actually see that, you can see what happens to the shadows in this picture. And the... Um, so blue is uh, shadow. And so blue is the shadows, and then red is the good resource. And then, so I think this was light intensity, and then this was light duration. And, um, and he just finished doing this, I just met with him yesterday, and he just finished doing this for Salt Lake County. Um, and it was something like a trillion data points. They just had a 32 core server run for a month to do it. Um, and, uh, and so it's really cool. But he, his whole thing, New York City's paying somebody millions of dollars to do this right now because they saw Kevin's staff. And, um, and so they, uh, and Kevin wants to basically, he's, he's got his sights on Park City, he wants to do St. George, he really wants to expand this out of the whole state. Um, what's really cool about this one, and then there's um, PV Watts is the National Renewable Energy Lab, um, which has this kind of thing, but it doesn't take into account shadows or anything. It's really, it's, it's aggregated over a bigger area, but it's really a really cool one. Um, the SAM model is one you guys should play with. You have to download it and it's big, but um, the, basically you can design systems with, and it'll look at all the economics and you can use any components and all this kind of fun stuff. And then this video, so these are all in the slides I sent out um, yesterday. The, um, it's about an hour long, but it's, it's, uh, it's a, it gets a little techy, but it kind of talks about, um, and the Rocky Mountain Institute is a big player in this. Um, they're kind of a clean energy think tank um, in Colorado, and they had, they kind of did this um, webinar on um, customer acquisition and soft costs and how to lower all that stuff. But um, I don't know if anybody has a, I don't know, see if it'll work, but um, this SLC Gov Solar, yeah, it's a little worried about that, but uh, it go, definitely go play with that because you can enter any address in the city and you can actually draw polygons on the thing and it'll tell you what that solar panel will produce, taking into account all of those, all that year round uh, data. So, so that's, that's based really on important. the simulation that mm -hmm. you just showed? Yeah, and, and you can get all sorts of data from, from that. And that's just for Salt Lake City proper now, kind of down at Sugar House. Um, but that will be, um, I think he's hoping to get it online in January or February for the whole county. So, and so, um, and so then, uh, like that, thank you for listening. If uh, you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Or you can feel free to give me a call or an email. Or we're over in the avenues if you guys want to stop by. Yeah. So I was curious, I was going to ask a little bit earlier, how much of the work of an individual do on their own, like resident, for installing solar panels? Because it sounded like some of the stuff that would be costly is designing it, so you could design yourself and you probably have to submit some sort of proper design for mm -hmm. uh, a permit and probably the cost for that. And then what part do you guys play in helping a resident get that? Installed. Um, so, through the Salt Lake Community Solar, um, we helped by basically being the conduit to this installer that was offering a really good price. Um, but with the uh, just kind of in general, um, basically a solar system, what you've got is you've got the panels, which are then mounted on a racking, which is secured to the roof, and then there's why, and then depends if um, so. There's inverters because solar panels put out DC. So there's inverters then that'll uh, change that to AC. Um, the standard that used to be is kind of the big central inverter. They'd all run together. Um, you guys are electrical engineers. No, no, no. But the uh, but they all ran in uh, you know all the the panels are in series and then they all ran together in parallel into uh, these inverters. Um, now what they're doing and so then but that could create a lot of shading issues. Um, now there's a microinverter that basically sits on the back of all the solar panels and they're tiny. And they can, they basically just take care of that one panel. So shading problems are alleviated a lot. Um, and, um, and that's actually really cool because then each panel, know, it, each inverter knows what's going on with the panels and you can actually monitor through your computer what's going on with all the panels. Um, but the, um, and then, so the, the hardest thing I'd say for most people when they install is doing the roofing because 
it's hard to do and not get your roof to leak. And so that's where a professional is really handy. Um, there's, excuse me, these things called flashings that I know they, uh, they put in to, that, are, that are waterproof somehow. And I don't know much about roofing at all. But, um, and then you've got to basically submit structural drawings showing that your roof is strong enough to the building department. And you've got to submit like an electrical drawing. Um, and so um, Salt Lake City would be kind of a hard one because they do all of their permitting online. And so you do have to give them CAD files. Um, but other areas, it's literally it's a drawing that they want. So it, it really depends. Um, but it's, it's definitely something um, that people do install their install their own. Um, so if it's a completely standalone system that mm -hmm. is not connected to a grid, let's say connect to a mm -hmm. battery or whatever, uh, it still needs to go through the permit. Right? Yeah, it's because, because it's a home improvement, so it still needs to go through the permit process. Yeah. Um, and batteries can be uh, can be tricky, they can get expensive to permit. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and then the, the big reason though to get a building permit um, is that Without a building permit, you can't get Rocky Mountain Power. They're the ones who ultimately come out and connect your system to the grid, whoever built it. And so they won't do it if there's no building permit. But um, so do you have to have, do you have to have an electrician approve it or a contract? Um, can you do it on your own even if you're not an electrician? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can. Yeah, if you want to design your own, build your own system, you could definitely you do it yourself as, as, long as, as long as it's permitted. Yeah. With that, somebody still has to come out and inspect. Yeah, it. but yeah, the city would still come out and inspect your job. Right. Uh, so these are all typically standard PVs, right? Does anybody mm -hmm. do CPVs at all, uh, concentrated? Um, there are, um, there definitely are people who do it. Um, there's option? one, yeah, I believe so. Um, I don't think that, it would really depend on the zoning. Um, and so right now, um, it would probably be a gray area in somewhere like Salt Lake. Um, but then, you know, if you went out to Summit County, where there's a lot of land, um, you know, and if you were doing it like on an agricultural um, building, like I, I actually know that there's been several kind of micro concentrating systems that have been installed recently in um, the Logan area. So that's definitely something that uh, that's out there. Actually, the largest CPU system in the U.S. I think is uh, right outside Las Vegas or something. Yeah, right? yeah, and there is. Like yeah, in, in California, but in the I think it's Tonopah, like that, uh, yeah, or yeah, something like that out there. Area. Yeah, it's, it so there huge. are a few in that area just because it's. But are they all commercial based, or is there anything? Well, they're 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 starting to get the technology starting to get there that they're making um, residential ones, but they're still kind of like the size of a flatbed truck, so they're not quite there yet. So I had a question on just like what policy makers actually thinking of this because it seems silly to me that you would have to have somebody draw up a CAD file mm -hmm. if you already have existing codes and you know okay mm -hmm. buildings conform to this known code mm -hmm. and you know we know the average weight of you know say each panel on the mounting system mm -hmm. and it should be pretty simple just like the direct TV guy comes out he bolts on your satellite dish through your roof and it's mm -hmm. not anything crazy so the fact that you would have to do a CAD drawing and all this improve that you're structurally so, sound you already have those existing codes that say okay mm -hmm. this house got built the one time it's two code right and granted I'm much less risk averse than say a city would be yeah. giving them a permit but like, what's the policy like? Are they just better safe than sorry? Or, I mean, why well, And so, through this project, that's something that was a big, through the Wasatch Solar Challenge, that was a big topic of discussion when it first started was, okay, what's gonna be uh, a good standard for if uh, the building, if they need to basically get a structural engineer to come out and look at the building. Mm -hmm. And what was decided is if the house was built after kind of the International Building Code came in, which in Utah was like 1978, then they were comfortable saying that that was built plenty strong, but before that, they had to get inspected. And so that was kind of a compromise they came to. But the cities definitely feel the same way. They'd like to not. It's not always that way. You also have a sale. It's a sale that's up there, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Nine, nine, basically, it has to stand up to 90 mile an hour winds and uh, about 80 pounds of snow. Mm -hmm. How about the safety if they are stored at home? What is that? I mean, a safety. If, you mean like for fire or things like that? Oh safety, yeah. yeah. And so they so the to to build a code they have to be able to withstand ninety mile an hour winds and about eighty pounds of snow in this area. And then the fire is really an interesting one. Um, they have to be built to fire to electrical code for fire reasons. Um, and then there there's a big discussion going on right now about because there's certain roofs that have different classes for different, basically, fire ratings and how fire resistant they are. And do the panels have to be the same as the roof? So that's a big discussion that's going on right now. 
and so the um, but yeah, but that's that's where the building departments come in is that they don't want houses burning down mm -hmm. or uh, panels flying off and ending in a neighbor's window and all that kind of stuff. And so yeah, that's a big topic of discussion. Yes, yeah, before you went, can you go back to your, the the picture of the space? An interesting. So so it's just for the class. If you think about it. Uh, can you think of interesting optic solutions to make this into a base load solution? Meaning you want to have power on all the time. I can think of huh? exactly. You said this is microwave. Um, yeah, the, it, it basically it sits out in geostationary orbit above a uh, microwave receiver, and it beams basically tries to get a frequency of microwaves that aren't um, absorbed by the atmosphere. And so and then just there's a basically a microwave receiving station on the ground. And um, they've built like little ones of these, but they haven't um, so they've kind of had proof of concept, but they haven't there's not been any kind of real utility scale yet. So so this is how satellite communications work when you can talk to them. it's interesting, I didn't know about this. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's like a <coughs> but yeah, let's just get you know generate all of our power off of Earth and just beam it down in. So one of the challenges that with this concept was keeping the microwaves fairly uh, tight, or fairly Probably. concentrated. Yeah. But yeah, you can design up fix it with airspace. So, so if you think about it, that's yeah, also yeah, what you do in communications. Right? You yeah, need to have a like ground station. Which can, yeah. So if you call from here to China. So on the other side of the world, right? it has to go through bounce off satellites. Right? They cannot disperse. So it's a solvable problem. The question is economics, I believe. But I don't know much about it. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, but then, you know, you, you're right though when you said baseload, like you could actually, you know, solar yeah. and on Earth, you know, the economics only work during the day. Yeah. This could produce 24 7. So, so the way so, I was uh, thinking, of course, this cannot be a geostationary satellite. Right, because then it will get dark. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. the sun, the Earth will create a shadow on it. Yeah. So it needs to be a non-geostationary satellite, and then you need to have mirrors yeah. also in the satellite's orbit to always be the adjust the angle such that you have almost like a heliostat. You always have a single point where you're not getting, which is an optical engineering problem. Solvable also, not not that hard. Anyway, let's, uh, uh, let's thank Billy again. This is